1989 solo album, Love from Cardiff, UK, Diamond Dan Sinclair. Well, Dan, there's a clip right here from Taint Your World from the Toto album, Falling In Between. To me, sounds a little like stomping at 8H and a little bit of I Want Some Action as well. What do you think? I don't see the direct connection. I can see the similarities to other Van Halen songs, but I think it's just more of the boogie that we were talking about earlier in the episode. Right. It's got that boogie beat, and Van Halen had some boogie beats in their songs. And, you know, Steve can sound like Ed once in a while. He's a very talented guitarist, or should I call him Luke? He likes to go by Luke, right? Yeah, right, right. So super talented and, and underrated guitarist. So is there a Van Halen similarity there? Yeah. Was it influenced by any of the work that he did with Eddie Van Halen when he was working with him? I don't know about that. I'd be surprised. I think it's just one of those songs that reminds you of Van Halen. I wouldn't make the jump that it sounds like anything that Luke had worked on with Ed before. Well, that wraps up the mailbag segment. And we are on to our deep dive interview with the authors of Eruption, Conversations with Eddie Van Halen. We talk with Brad Talinsky and Chris Gill, the co-authors of the book. First of all, they're really nice guys who are very, very intelligent and incredibly steeped in Van Halen knowledge. These two guys have spent so much time with Ed through the years interviewing him and really got great interviews out of Ed. I said this before and I'll say it again. Whenever Guitar World did interviews with Ed, Ed did better interviews interviews because he was much more comfortable with Guitar World than he was with anybody else, any other type of journalist. He was a little more guarded. With Guitar Guys, he's a little more chill. He feels like they're part of his club and he was much more open. And boy, is he open in this book. Go buy this book. Eruption Conversations with Eddie Van Halen by Brad Talinsky and Chris Gill. Phenomenal, phenomenal book. Every dollar it costs you, you'll want to pay for it twice. That's how good it is. It is really, really worthwhile. We get into a very deep discussion with these guys. We get into the weeds on everything Eddie Van Halen. You do not want to miss this. This is a fantastic episode, and it is all coming up next. Take a listen. Well, you got to plan ahead. And also, you know, if you don't place yourself geographically, if you don't go out there, what are you going to sing about? Again, you know, you can join the Keith Richards fan club. <laughs> Those are the rule rather than the exception. Don't get me wrong. You know, I just get up a little earlier so we can accomplish as much as we can dream up and still drink the beer that my body needs, right? <laughs> Hello, loyal listeners. Wanted to let you know about our new Patreon. If you like what we do and you have the means, drop us a donation to keep the podcast going. Go to patreon.com backslash DD Unchained. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash D-D-U-N-C-H-A-I-N-E-D. Doesn't have to be huge. Any side's contributions are greatly appreciated. Those who contribute $40 or more will get the Unchained package. Trust me, it's worth it. Contribute $65 or more and get the Romeo Delight package, which is Unchained plus more. And $95 scores you the Top Jimmy package, which is the Kitchen Sink. If you're a Van Halen hardcore and listen to this cast, this is stuff you'll appreciate. It's ear candy. Go to patreon.com backslash Unchained. Email your contact information to Podcast at gmail.com. What is understood need not be discussed. Author Greg Renoff is back with a new book, Ted Templeman, A Platinum Producer's Life and Music, the new biography of the record producer Ted Templeman, who went on to produce Van Halen, the Doobie Brothers, Van Morrison, Aerosmith, Sammy Hagar, and more. The book, which runs 1995, and it's currently available at Amazon.com. From the man who brought you Van Halen Rising comes Ted Templeman, a platinum producer's life and music, written by Templeman as told to Greg Renoff. 
available for only nineteen ninety five at Amazon.com. Order it today. Hi, this is Brian Young, formerly of the David Lee Roth Band, and you're listening to Dave and Dave Unchained. If you would like to send us a letter asking a question or making a statement or whatever you'd like to say, you can send it to ddunchainedpodcast at gmail.com. Check out the new podcast, The Rock Quarry, your place to hear in-depth interviews with some of Rock's most colorful characters, with your host, entertainment journalist David J. Crible. The Rock Quarry is available for free on Spreaker and iTunes. You can check us out on Facebook at The Rock Quarry Podcast, on Twitter at Rock Quarry Pod, on Instagram at The Rock Quarry Podcast, or email us at The Rock Quarry Podcast at gmail.com. Thing. You know, in the club days, we had to play top 40 to get to gigs, and it was Im- impossible for me to, to emulate what these records. I could not make, for the life of me, I tried so hard to make the, the songs we had to play, to make them sound like the record. And, but it was also a, a blessing in disguise, because all I could do was me. No matter what I played, it sounded like me. And that's why whenever you hear Van Halen, you know it's Van Halen, because that's all we can do. You hear, Al, you hear Alex's drums, you know it's his drums, you know? Uh, it's just uh, the nature of the beast. Ladies and gentlemen, we have two incredible guests this evening. One is an ex-editor-in-chief of Guitar World, who still writes for Guitar World, that's Brad Tolinsky, as well as the senior editor of Guitar World, who is also a writer, Chris Gill. Both Brad and Chris have put out, or about to put out, I should say, an incredible book called Eruption Conversations with Eddie Van Halen. Gentlemen, congratulations. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, thanks, David, Dave. This book is tremendous. We're going to start off by telling you guys, uh, Dave and I, thanks to Brad and Chris, got us an advanced copy, and it is everything that you want. So if you listen to this podcast, whatever you're doing, do yourself a favor, go on Amazon and order this. It is worth every penny. These two gentlemen have put together conversations with Eddie through the years that are really a beautiful compilation. So I want to congratulate you both. It is available on October 5th. Obviously, you can buy it on Amazon. I'm sure bookstores will have it as well. Wanted to start off by asking you guys, how did the idea for the book come about? And was it a reaction to Ed's death or was it already in motion? This is Brad Zielinski here. Well, I had written a book about seven or eight years ago now called Conversations with uh, Jimmy Page. And it did quite well. It was turned into many different languages and was a big success. And I started thinking about another history of guitar book called Play It Loud. But then I started thinking about what the next project could be. I knew that Ed wasn't in great condition. So I started thinking a bit about my relationship with him and and how many times I'd spoken to him over the years. And I thought, well, that would be interesting. And then I thought, well, I don't know if I have everything covered. And Chris and I had worked together at Guitar World, and Chris had done many interviews with Ed, especially in the latter half of his career. And I thought, well, let's make something really, really great and put both of our heads together and create sort of the ultimate Edward Van Halen biography and, you know, what would make ours different than the other books on the market is that both of us had a long-term relationship with Ed. We'd spoken to him many times at 5150 and it just turned out to be such a great collaboration. I've admired Chris's work through the years and I think it just turned out great. I will say this is Chris talking and I just wanted to add to that that We were working on it while Ed was still alive, and we actually hoped to have his participation. There was like a few little things here and there that we wish we could have had him answer questions about. In fact, just about a year before he passed, I had been working on trying to get Ed to to sit down and do an extensive interview on the Van Halen 2 album. Unfortunately, when that came about, that was kind of the beginning of this, you know, period where he just, you know, he had agreed to do it, but he had this motorcycle accident and couldn't talk really after that. He was, you know, more focusing on his health 
But that was our intention. Of course, that's passing, unfortunately, kind of moved things along a lot faster than we kind of anticipated. So it was a very sad development, but we felt also at the same time and it kind of increased the urgency to get this project out. Now, I always felt that Guitar World always got the best out of Ed. I've seen and read so many different interviews with Ed through the years Ed, as you guys well know, was not really pleased with doing press. He did it because he had to. Someone like David Lee Roth would talk everybody's ear off all day long. But Ed was a musician. As you know, he spoke mainly with his hands. However, I always felt that with Guitar World, he kind of let his guard down a little bit. I think he was a little more relaxed. And therefore, Guitar World always got the better interviews. Do you think that was because that you guys were musicians, you came from a different perspective than the average journalist? Most definitely. I found with Ed, especially, you know, since I talked with him a lot since 2005, he really appreciated the audience as much as anything. I think he knew that he wanted to speak to guitarists. I mean, he, of course, took more interest in that starting his own company, the EVH brand of products. I think he felt like musicians really got him. He loved guitar so much. And I think it was just, it was kind of him paying people back or something like that i guess it's you know it was it was kind of different than just the average fan the music fan you know it was really there was just a, a certain language and a certain kinship that he felt with guitar players and i also think that the good thing about guitar world and our writers was that we could actually sort of bro down a little bit with that too like i i do note that some of the other guitar journalists were almost too worshipful and that made him uncomfortable as well. I mean, Ed's a couple of years older than me. We're relatively the same age. And I found that I could just, you know, I respected his ability as a player, but I could also talk to him as a human being. I think that was the case with Chris as well. We didn't go over to 5150 and stare at him like he was, you know, Mount Rushmore or something. He never liked that kind of attention. You know, in the book, he made a comment. I, I thought this was interesting. He said, this is a quote from the book. He's talking about Michael Anthony. He didn't really ever do anything. He had zero input whatsoever, period. He remodeled his whole house and bought himself a Turbo Carrera off the money he made off of us. Whatever. I never even listened to his bass when we recorded. I never liked Mike's sound, and most of the time, I could never hear him. What do you think that's all about? You're going right for it. Well, I mean, listen, it's right there in the in the book. I mean, I, I just... Hey, we only have a certain amount of time. So, you know, we're just diving in. Getting right, right to the, the right to the, the flame and yawn right here. So. Oh, oh, no, we got better ones. We got this is just a warm up question. I well, well I, I will say, I mean, that was a, that was a moment in time for Ed. You know, his attitude about Mike changed over the years, but at that point in time, he was really kind of in just a very down kind of frame of mind, and I think he was feeling a little bit underappreciated. And just you know, it was just it, that, that was kind of sometimes Ed could get a little negative. Yeah. Uh, and other times he could be the sweetest guy in the world, you know, and yeah. just appreciative of everybody around him and everything. And I think at that point he was just kind of feeling the weight of the world and yeah. just really kind of just letting loose. Yeah. Well, I think that there was a dichotomy there with Ed. Like on one level, he wanted to control a lot, but then he sort of resented it when you didn't put in your two cents. I think that was probably a complicated road for Mike to navigate you know, when to put in his two cents and when not to. And at that point in Ed's career, he was feeling the pressure that somehow was all on him. Yet at the same time, he could be like, I don't really want your input. I just want to do my thing. So I think Mike was always caught a little bit between a rock and a hard place. It's hard to say whether Ed really, 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 really wanted that input or not. That is confusing. So now, do you think that Ed simply saw Van Halen as him and Al and everybody was sort of on the kind of the outside? And he always seemed to think him and Al are Van Halen and then everybody else is just kind of extra sauce. My input on that would be it was, you know, his work ethic was insane. He was almost obsessive. And I think, you know... It really boils down to, I mean, not to not he didn't say this in an egotistical way, but he knew, and he even said that, you know, we'll kind of didn't say that directly, but without 
Eddie Van Halen, there is no Van Halen. I think even going beyond Al, of course, Al was like the drummer he played with all his life. Alex was definitely a crucial part of that. I don't think he could see him ever replacing him with a drummer. I mean, it's very much like like with Pantera with, with Dimebag and, you know, his brother, same kind of type of relationship. You know, they just always played together and they're their brothers and everything. And you just can't imagine one without the other. And I think that's kind of the end.